That's one set of powers that you have as a United States Senator, and I will use them as best I can to defend and promote the foundational principles that have made us the greatest nation in world history. The Second Amendment right to bear arms is one of those principles. Right. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. All right, and welcome in, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics. As you can see, we have a very special guest with us this evening, representative from District 5 of the great state of Alabama, Congressman Mo Brooks. Welcome to the program. My pleasure. All right, so I wanted to ask you several different things. Of course, you launched your Senate campaign just the other night, and we're very excited about that. You've done that once before, trying to uh, get the seat that was eventually taken by Doug Jones. And that's actually kind of where I wanted to start us out tonight, because last time in that primary, there were millions of dollars sunk into trying to specifically torpedo you. About 15 million. Right. Um, I, I heard 13, and, you know, I, I heard 15, and... Regardless, it was a lot of money. It was. And it was specifically targeted at painting you as an anti-Trump, uh, I don't even know what to say it, well, just it was a, a heretic, they, I guess. Is the they were trying to, to paint me as anti-Trump. Right. And I was the only candidate in the race who had actually contributed to help Donald Trump win the election. Right. They were trying to portray me as Nancy Pelosi's best friend, which of course right. which is, is laughable. pretty defamatory in a Republican primary. They are trying to portray me as being opposed to the Second Amendment right to bear arms when mm -hmm. I've got a straight A grade with the National Rifle Association and Gun Owners of America. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to portray me as being anti-military when I'm the home for one of the most important military bases in the United States at Redstone Arsenal that I've helped expand as we try to do the things that are necessary to enable our war fighters to prevail. You know, and I hate to say it, but it was incredibly effective. I remember I was sitting in a auto repair shop, the waiting room, and nobody knows who I am because I'm a radio guy, not a video guy. I do video now, but back then I just did radio, so no one recognized me. I was just sitting there minding my own business, and I heard they had a, a local news thing on, and they ran one of those ads that was paid for by Mitch McConnell. And one of the things that it said was basically trying to make the case that you were anti-Trump, and I remember the guy said... Well, I don't know if I want to vote for Luther or Roy Moore, but I know one thing, I'm not voting for that guy. And I, I kind of already knew that being in politics, but it was like, it, it amazed me how effective those things were when, as you just pointed out, there wasn't a lick of truth to any of it. Well, it had no effect whatsoever in the parts of the state where people know me, right? which is the northern tier of the state of Alabama. But in the southern tier of the state of Alabama, where people don't know me, and that's the only impression people have, it does have an effect. Now, right. this time around and since then, I've been endorsed not once but twice by Donald Trump uh, for election in 2018 to Congress and 2020 uh, for Congress. Very strong words in my favor by President Trump. And then I was asked by President Trump's team to be co-chair of uh, the Alabama re-election campaign for Donald Trump. We've had an excellent working relationship, but unless the people know that, then they don't know when you have a candidate like myself who is being mm -hmm. lied about, as Mitch McConnell did so effectively in the 2017 race. Well, that's one other thing that I wanted to ask you about, because um, you're going to be running a, a statewide race, obviously, again, and, and that is going to be uh, a little bit more of a challenge, because like you said, up in your district, they love you because they know you and they pay attention, and, and they didn't really know you as well the first time you started making headway here. Do you see a repeat of that, or do you think now, because of everything that went on with you being like on the literally on the front lines in the House, um, do you think that that makes a difference, that people, because of that, are going to know you, and it'll be harder for them to repeat the same attack and it to be as effective? Well, if they launch the same Mo Brooks doesn't like Donald Trump attack that they uh, successfully launched in 2017, it's going to fall on deaf ears, but to the extent it doesn't, we're going to have a lot more firepower this go-around than I had in 2017 with which to respond with. Mm -hmm. And you've got one endorsement by Donald Trump, a second endorsement by Donald Trump in 2020, perhaps, who knows, a third endorsement uh, in this Senate race. Good you've day. also got that I was co-chair of his campaign at his request. Uh, I spoke at the Ellipse, according to the White House political director, at Donald Trump's request. 
Uh, Donald Trump and I have talked in the last four weeks three times where he's called me and we've had good discussions about this Senate race. Right. Um, I think we've got pretty good rebuttal. No, and I would so, say so. And so I look forward to any of my opponents trying to make that kind of case because it's going to fall miserably on its face. And when that happens, that will actually enhance my stature with voters and, of course, hurt whoever is behind those kinds of malicious and false attacks. Well, now, I certainly hope that that winds up being the case because I don't know if I ever told you this, but you were my first pick in that primary. Like, well, I, I supported you very early on um, as a founding member of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, but one thing that I did want to ask about that is if you become senator, you have to work with Mitch McConnell. Is that going to be a problem considering how much money he spent trying to torpedo you? Or do you think that you'll be able to, to make some headway in that area? Well, in politics, it's often said that politics makes strange bedfellows. And what that really means is you wouldn't anticipate two or, two or more people being able to work together because of past fights. If you're a professional at this, then what you're supposed to do is put those past fights behind you so that when there's common ground, you can work together. So I'm sure that to the extent that Mitch McConnell wants to advocate, excuse me, advocate uh, conservative principled positions, I'm going to be all on board. But if he's going to want to cave in to socialist demands, I'm going to be in adamant opposition. So it's really going to depend on whether I am persuaded that the position I'm being asked to take protects and promotes the foundational principles that have combined to make America the greatest nation in world history. If so, we're going to be allies and we're going to be hand in glove trying to make sure that those foundational principles are protected and promoted. On the other hand, if I perceive that what I'm being asked to do undermines those foundational principles that have combined to make America the greatest nation in world history, well, I'm going to be fighting them. But that's the way it should be. We each have our own belief system. Um, some public policy positions, uh, sometimes they're close, sometimes they're different. Mm -hmm. And you need to advocate on behalf of the public policy positions that you believe are in the best interests of your country. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to control my actions based on what Mitch McConnell or even Chuck Schumer mm -hmm. may do. I'm going to control my actions based on what is the issue before me and is it going to help America or hurt America. And that will determine whether I'm going to support or fight what is in front of me. That will also determine who my allies or enemies may be on that particular bill. When you get to another bill, mm -hmm. it's a new ball game. See, I don't think that's the way that politics works in 2020. You can't just make decisions based on whether or not you agree with the policy. It's supposed to be personal. You, you understand that, right? Yeah, I don't make public policy decision based on personalities if you that's refreshing if you devolve to that level then you're you should not be in office because you're not doing what your city your county your state or your federal government needs you to do yeah i i 100 agree i i kind of go along with the philosophy that abraham lincoln espoused which is i will stand with any man when he is right there you go but uh, one other thing that I did want to ask you, too, because, of course, you, we were talking earlier uh, at a meeting that happened uh, earlier today, and you were talking about your experience with what happened with the shooting at the, the baseball field when a, a Bernie Sanders supporter tried to murder a tenth of Congress. And one thing that I wanted to ask you about specifically is I think that's incredibly relevant considering what's happened the past 48 hours with the two mass shootings that have happened and President Joe Biden coming out and actually saying that basically we don't even have to wait for the details. The details are irrelevant. They don't matter to this. I don't have to wait. His exact quote was uh, not one more minute to move forward on gun control policy and try to ban assault weapons and so on and so forth. And so, uh, A, what can you do in the House? Or B, what will you do if, if you're in the Senate when some of this stuff happens to go through, if we're still fighting that fight a couple of years from now? Uh, what can be done to try to curtail that? Well, one thing I want to emphasize to the people of the state of Alabama, the best way to evaluate what a candidate is going to do is by looking at what a candidate has done. When it comes to the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, I am very consistent. That provision in the Bill of Rights is ranked as number two out of the ten in the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. because it is the most important provision in protecting all other citizens' rights and in protecting the United States Constitution. The right to bear arms emphasizes that we're serious in America about liberty, about freedom, about 
our country's destiny being controlled by the will of American voters. And it's that Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms that enables us to defend our republic and defend our rights should the central government ever become dictatorial. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that the people who wrote the United States Constitution had just gotten through fighting a revolutionary war that lasted roughly seven years, seven years, with a lot of American lives lost, well into the thousands. I don't remember the exact number, but it's up there, okay? okay. And it was fought to prevent Americans from being subjects of dictatorial power, in this case, the monarchy of England. Mm -hmm. So the Second Amendment is there for a big purpose. I hate it when people misuse the Second Amendment and engage in the kinds of things that we saw in Georgia or in Colorado recently or on a ball field with congressmen uh, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. But the Second Amendment has a function and you have to weigh the benefits and the costs associated with that function and protecting our republic is essential so I'm going to support it. And that's where voters can look at my track record in the past, figure out what I'm going to do in the future. And I have, over a 10-year period of time, a straight-A record with both the Gun Owners of America and the National Rifle Association, both of which evaluate each congressman and each senator's votes and other things that are related to the Second Amendment. Well... One other thing that I wanted to ask, because it's going to be incredibly important uh, as, as we're coming up, because if you were to win this race, win the primary, win the Senate, and you became one of the senators from, from the state of Alabama, if that were to take place, it would be in Senator Harris's first or second, or uh, uh, sorry, President Harris's first or second year, I'm guessing, uh, if, if it comes to that. If that does take place, um, what could you as the Senate do if, if we're still at that 50-50 um, and, and it just preserves where it is? Like, what, what function can you play in trying to stop their agenda from getting through? When you're a United States Senator, you basically have two powers. You have your vote. And that vote can be reflected on the Senate floor or it can be reflected in preliminary matters such as holds that you can place on ratification of nominees to the judiciary or to the executive branch for appointments, holds you might can place on treaties or on individual bills. Mm -hmm. So that's one set of powers that you have as a United States Senator, and I will use them as best I can to defend and promote the foundational principles that have made us the greatest nation in world history. The Second Amendment right to bear arms is one of those principles. Right. The second power you have is persuading the public of the righteousness of the cause, the position that you hold, in hopes that the public will figure out, hey, that guy's right, my senator's wrong, I need to contact my senator and get them on the right path. So you can affect public policy with your vote or the procedural mechanisms that are permitted in the Senate, and you can affect public opinion by the statements that you make publicly, the people you communicate pub with publicly, which in turn can ultimately affect the votes and actions and conduct of other United States senators. Well, so and, I'm going to just, use both of those as best I can. Yeah, and just speaking from my opinion, um, I appreciate that you make it a point to do that even in the House right now because as much as I love Gary Palmer, the guy's not in front of the camera very often. I've always appreciated your ability to stand in front of the camera and not just make the right vote, but make the case for why your vote is the correct one. Well, so, thank you. So I very much uh, wish you good luck and appreciate you taking some time to be with us here in the audience. Mo Brooks, District 5 of Alabama, running for Senate for the seat that's going to be vacated by Senator Richard Shelby. Thank you so much for being with us, Congressman. MoBrooks.com. That's right. <laughs> that's the place yeah, to go. Got, got to plug that. MoBrooks.com. Yeah, if you want to support, donate, anything like if that. If you want to make to a there. contribution, if you want to be a volunteer, please go to MoBrooks.com. That's right. three times. <laughs> Hopefully that's, a, that's the charm. I'm sure it'll stick with my audience. And All if right. not, you can rewind it and watch it again. All, All right. right. MoBrooks.com. Thank you so much, Congressman Brooks. We'll see you later. My pleasure. Thank you. Yep. A recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline 
before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.